Go ahead and take a seat, and as you're doing so, take your Bibles or your apps, whatever you read on, and turn to Luke 24, Luke chapter 24. Uh, If you don't have a Bible, grab one out of the pew. Uh, They are available to you. If you don't have a Bible at home, grab that Bible and take it home with you, because we want everybody here to have a Bible at home that they can read and study and, and refer to when they need that. So feel free. That is our gift to you. Now, in today's society... It's kind of hard to figure out a lot of times what is real and what's been faked, especially like on social media, right? Um, How many of you have seen a a faked or forged or photoshopped picture on Facebook or Instagram? They're, They're all over the place. Yesterday, I was on Facebook a total of 20 minutes. I know, pretty impressive, right? Self control in action. Um, 20 minutes. And I saw three different posts that were completely false. And the people who posted them thought they were true. Two of them were pictures. One of them was a a statement that was made. They were shared from another source, but they were completely and totally not true. Uh, And guys, just on a side note, if you're on social media, before you share something, check it out first. We are called to be a people of truth and not spread lies. And and so the least you can do is spend four minutes on Google checking out whether what you're about to post is true or not, rather than spreading another lie. So now that I'm off my soapbox, um, back to it's hard to figure out what's been faked and what's true, though. In this world of computer graphics and Photoshop and technology, we, we sometimes have a difficult time sifting through what's fake and what's not. And let me be very honest with you right here at this point, because I've gone through points in my faith where I I struggled figuring out whether the Bible was fake or true as well. Uh, I've gone through points in my faith where I've read something in God's Word and gone, really? Did that really happen? I mean, think about it for a second. How many of you know somebody who's been swallowed by a whale, lived in that whale for three days, and then got spit out on shore just fine? None of us, because it doesn't happen. The Bible is filled with accounts that are miraculous and beyond the physical realm of possibility because that's the kind of God that we serve. But it does make it hard to believe sometimes. And today's passage is actually one of the passages that I've struggled with in the past. And so let's look at Luke 24. We're going to start in verse 36, but let me give you the background real quick. What's happened up to this point? Luke 24, verse 36. Basically, Jesus has died on the cross. He has risen from the dead, and he has appeared to a handful of people. And let me give you just a few of those people. First, he appeared to some of the women who went to uh, anoint his body the day after the Sabbath, three days later. So the tomb's open, Jesus walks out in victory over sin and death. The women had gone to the tomb to anoint his dead body, find it empty, and then he appears to them uh, as they're going back, okay? He, he's appeared to the women, the women went back to the disciples, told them what happened, did not believe them at all. Disciples are like, you're crazy, you're hallucinating, something's wrong with your mind, go talk to somebody who can help you sift out your issues. Then... There's a couple of followers of Christ, not disciples, but followers of Christ who decided, you know what, we're done with this, we're going to go back home to Emmaus. So they go down the road to Emmaus, and as they're walking down this road, a guy joins them, starts talking, reveals the scriptures about how the Christ was supposed to die and then rise from the grave. They take him to their house when they get to Emmaus, as was the custom in Jewish uh, culture in that day and time. And as he's praying for the meal that they prepared for them, their eyes are open. They reveal it's Jesus. And then Jesus disappears. Pretty freaky. And so the two guys look at each other and go, we got to go back to Jerusalem, tell the disciples. So they pack their stuff up and they book it back to Jerusalem. They go into the upper room where the disciples are at. And that's where we pick up in verse 36 of Luke chapter 24. So verse 36, read with me. As they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace to you. Now stop right there. Because I think many of us have read this passage too many times and we've lost the wonder 
that is in this passage, the, the amazement that this passage reveals to us. So imagine for just a moment, what do you think the mood in the upper room was like at this point? Think about it for a second. It's the 11 remaining disciples, a handful of Jesus' other followers, and the women, the women who had gone to anoint Jesus' body, the close followers. Jesus has died. They believe that someone has gone in and stolen his body, basically meaning that the last three years that they have spent following Jesus and dedicating their life to him has been totally lost. They've just wasted, in their own minds, because they don't know the truth yet, they believe in their minds that they've just thrown three years of ministry down the toilet because their Savior, the Savior of the world, is dead, not alive. What do you think the mood was like in that room? I would guess that it would be one of devastation. Their moral, their will would have been completely destroyed. I would guess that they would be sad beyond anything that we could understand. That in that room, there was a lot of crying. There was a lot of sadness. I would also guess that there was a lot of fear. Uh, Another one of the Gospels tells us that the upper room was actually locked because the disciples feared that the Romans would come in and arrest and kill them as well. In other words, this is not a room that any of us would want to sit in. Sad, depressed, destroyed, afraid. None of the things that we like to feel, that's exactly what that room would have been like. And then, in the midst of this horrible mood, two guys who you're fam- they're familiar with, they knew these two guys very well, two guys come rushing into the room and go, guys, you'll never believe what just happened. We were on the road to Emmaus, and this guy started talking to us, and he walked with us, and he revealed the scripture to us, and as we got to our house, we ate, and he prayed for us, and it was Jesus! And the disciples are going, oh, you lost it. (laughs) They went cuckoo. The heat got to them on the road, but something's wrong with these guys because what they just described is crazy talk. And as... (laughs) That was awesome, little man. And as they're thinking that this is all just lunacy... Suddenly, out of nowhere, with the doors and windows locked, bam, Jesus appears. Can you imagine what they must have felt like in that moment of going from complete and utter destruction and sadness and depression and fear to a moment of utter excitement and fear and wonder and crazy thoughts about what's going on? Think about Peter. Peter just a few days ago, had denied Jesus three times, never got the chance to apologize. He is living in the lowest state he's probably ever lived in his life, and now Jesus is standing in front of him. I can only imagine that the excitement building up inside of Peter would have been expressed through tears and shaking and just not knowing what to do. And so Jesus appears in front of them, And goes, peace be with you. Thank you for laughing because that was really bad. Um, But Jesus appears to them and goes, peace be with you. And the room probably was silent. So let's read on. Verse 37 says, but they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. And he said to them, why are you troubled and why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. Okay, stop there for just a second. So Jesus realizes the mood, obviously, and goes, Guys, it's okay. Look. Touch. See that I'm real. I'm not a ghost. I have flesh and bones, and you can see the wounds in my hand. Here's the side where they they stab me with the spear. Look at my feet. And they're standing there still in amazement. So pick back up. Verse 41. 
And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, Have you anything to eat? I've been dead for three days. I'm pretty hungry. Oh, got any fish? Verse 42, And they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it before them. And then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Now stop there. Let me explain this statement to you real quick so you understand. In Jesus' day and time, they didn't have the New Testament. And so they had what we call the Old Testament was referred to as the Hebrew Bible. And the Hebrew Bible had three sections to it. And it still does today. They believed that the first section was called the Law of Moses. And that's the first five books of the Old Testament. Genesis through Deuteronomy. Then was the second section, the prophets. And the prophets was any historical book or any book that was written by a prophet. So think of 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings, um, Isaiah, Jeremiah, the 12 minor prophets that are found at the very end of your Old Testament. Um, All of those were considered prophets, prophet books. And then the last section was called the Psalms. And it's not just the book of Psalms. Uh, these refer to any books that they considered psalms or books of wisdom. And so it would include the book of Job, because they considered the book of Job a book of wisdom and knowledge directly from God. The book of Psalms, the book of Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Lamentations, different books like that. Those were considered psalms or book of wisdom. And so when Jesus right here says that everything written about me must be fulfilled, everything that's written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. He's basically telling them, everything in the Old Testament is about me, and I'm fulfilling it right now. So understand that he's making a very bold statement. I'm going to come back to this in a moment. So come back to the passage. Um, Verse 45 Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. And you are my witnesses of these things. And behold, I'm sending the promise of my Father upon you, But stay in the city until you're clothed with power from on high. Then he led them out as far as Bethany and lifted up his hands. He blessed them. And while he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple blessing God. Pretty unbelievable passage. And let me be very honest with you at this point. This is a passage early in my faith that I struggled with. I struggled believing that something like this could happen. How did a guy who had physical form suddenly appear in a locked room? How did a guy uh, ascend into heaven? I don't know about you, but I haven't seen anybody praying and suddenly start floating up into the sky. It doesn't happen. And so I've struggled with this passage. And as someone who likes to talk a lot as a pastor, I can tell you that a lot of People who do not believe in Jesus also struggle with this passage because it's so miraculous. And please, if you in this room are someone who does not believe in Jesus or struggle uh, following Jesus or you don't believe what this passage says, here's what I'm going to do this morning. I'm going to unpack this whole passage for you and explain it and tell you why it is true. So what's the first thing that we can glean, what we can learn from this passage? Well, the first thing is that he was revealed. He was revealed. Jesus was revealed. You see, in verse 44, Jesus pretty much says that all of the Bible points back to him. All of the Old Testament points to Jesus Christ. And let me give you a great example of that. There are somewhere between 300 and 400 different prophecies about the coming Messiah found throughout the Old Testament. And they range from 
his birthplace to where he's going to be born and how he's going to be born and where he's going to travel and how he's going to minister and when he's going to minister and how he's going to die in intricate details. I mean, the prophecies range over his entire life and give really exact details about him. That's 300 to 400 predictions about one single person that was fulfilled by one single person. In, the, in Jesus Christ. Jesus fulfilled all 300. Now, if you know math and statistics, or maybe you're a science guru, you know that fulfilling 300 predictions that were made hundreds of years before the person who fulfilled them even lived, statistically is not possible. It doesn't happen. This is one of the great proofs of the existence of God and his son Jesus being the Savior. Because no one person could fulfill that many predictions made that far out as far as years go from him. It's just not a statistical possibility. And so this is a big deal. Prophecy matters. It's kind of an important thing. And let me tell you, when I, was, I had a point in college when I was struggling with my faith. And I had a buddy come to me and we were just chit-chatting and he brought up the amazing prophecies found in Psalm 22. And Psalm 22 has been a psalm that has personally influenced me greatly as far as the strength of my faith because of the prophecies found in it. So let me just real quick explain Psalm 22 to you so that you can understand what I'm talking about. Psalm 22 opens, verse 1 of Psalm 22 says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Exact words of Jesus on the cross. Now, whether Jesus was quoting directly from Psalm 22, or whether um, it was Jesus directly pointing to Psalm 22, we don't know, but it's a prophecy that is fulfilled in Jesus. If you keep reading Psalm 22, it begins talking about how the people will turn their backs on him, and they'll reject him. And then when you get down into verses 16 through 18, it starts describing in detail how Jesus would die and some of the circumstances that take place around his death. For example, this is the passage in the Old Testament that says, my hands and my feet are pierced by them. Then it goes on to say that those who pierce me will cast lots for my clothes. Now, if you know the story of Jesus' death, we know that he was pierced in his hands and feet, hung on a cross, and that as he was dying, the Roman soldiers gathered his clothes up and threw them down and cast lots to take his clothes. In other words, they rolled dice or farkled or something to, uh, you know, to decide who was going to get Jesus' clothes because cl clothing was very valuable in that day and time. Exact details given about the death of Jesus, but it gets even better than that. David, King David from the Old Testament, wrote Psalm 22. King David lived more than 1,000 years before Jesus was born. So when he wrote Psalm 22, it wouldn't be fulfilled for another 1,000 plus years. Not only that, it talks about his hands and feet being pierced in David's day and time, there was no such means of torture or death. Crucifixion, most historians agree, the crucifixion wasn't even invented until 5 to 700 B.C. by the Persians. In other words, David wrote how Jesus would die three to 500 years before the method was even invented. Don't tell me that's miraculous. That's not miraculous. Don't tell me that that's not proof that God exists, because how else could such an accurate prediction of the death of the Messiah come about unless it's a miracle, unless it's God speaking through King David in Psalm 22? And guys, there's over 300 more instances just like this in the Old Testament. That alone is proof of God's existence. Prophecy is Important, But here's a crazy thing. If you keep reading in this passage in Luke 24, it says that once Jesus makes this bold statement about the entire Old Testament pointing to him, he then has to explain it to his disciples. Guys, 
This was before the disciples had the Holy Spirit living in them. And so you and I have an advantage over the disciples because we have the Holy Spirit in us right now. If you are a believing follower of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit lives in you to help you understand God's word. And if you come across difficult passages or you have something in your faith that you're struggling to understand, we have an entire staff here that would love to sit down with you and talk with you about it. And so just ask us. We would love to help you decipher some of these difficult passages. But all of this goes down to one question. I said he was revealed, but my question to you is, is he revealing himself to you? Is he revealing himself to you? Are you actively pursuing a life-changing relationship with your Savior? My wife went out of town this weekend for a conference uh, convention thing that she had to do for her work. And, um, you know, we texted back and forth and called uh, throughout her three days gone and everything. And um, so we communicated. But if I wanted to hear from my wife and I never picked up or checked my phone, what did I expect would happen? I'm not going to hear from her if I'm not tapping into the way that she communicates with me. And the same is true for us as followers of Christ. If we want to hear from God, if we want God to reveal himself to us, then we need to be opening our Bibles and spending time in prayer and studying. How do you expect to hear from God if your Bible is on a shelf collecting dust? And how do you expect from, to hear from God if you are never on your knees asking to hear from him? Too many of us as Christians have gotten lazy about seeking God. We think if we just stand here and go to church on Sundays that everything will be okay. But Christ says, no, I want a relationship with you. And a relationship means that you're talking and you're spending time with the person you have a relationship with. So if you're not spending time with the Lord, then you're never going to hear from him because you're not even tapping into the way he communicates with us. So is he revealing himself to you? And then, is he revealing himself to others through you? Is he revealing himself to the people around you through the way you live and the things you say? And remember this question, because I'm going to come back to it, because I think it's important. So, we've talked about, in this passage, that he was revealed. Now, I want to talk about the fact that this passage shows that he lived, Jesus lived, and not just in a spiritual sense, Jesus lived in a physical sense. And in your notes, I've got several um, theories um, of his presence, theories of his presence, because there are a lot of uh, worldly explanations of how Jesus' body disappeared. You know, we know that he rose from the grave in triumph over sin and death, but there are people who don't believe in Jesus that have explained it away through different theories. The first theory is the swoon theory. And simply stated, the swoon theory believes that he just passed out on the cross. And that later on down the road, they buried him, and the disciples snuck in, revived him, and he walked out. Kind of crazy thought, but let me explain why this is not possible. First off, Let me explain crucifixion, because if you know the account of Jesus, you know that he was hung on the cross. There were two other criminals. They were hanging on either side of him, and they hung there for somewhere around six hours. And as they're hanging on the cross, it was getting close to sunset. And sunset, when the sun had set on that particular day, the sun setting symbolized the beginning of the Sabbath, which meant nobody could work. So basically... Before the sunset, they needed to get these guys killed and get them off the cross so that they didn't have to work once the sun had gone down. And so what the Bible tells us is that the Roman soldiers walked up to the two criminals and broke their legs so that they would die. Now, here's what happens in crucifixion, and I'm speaking from experience. Um, I'm not Jesus, but I play him in a passion play. Um, When you hang on a cross, I hope none of us have to, When someone hangs on the cross, what happens is, is your arms are stretched because the weight of your body and legs pull down on your arms. And what it does is it prevents your diaphragm from being able to pull and open your lungs up to take a breath. 
Crucifixion does not kill you by bleeding to death or anything like that. Crucifixion kills you by suffocating you to death slowly. And so as you're hanging, you can't take a breath. And so what the criminal would do is push up with their feet to let off the pressure from their arms, take a breath, but because there are so many nerve endings and small bones within the foot, the pain is too excruciating to maintain. So a prisoner would push up, take a breath, and then drop right back down and let that air out immediately because the pain was too much on their feet to hold. And so what the Roman soldiers did with the criminals was they walked up and broke their legs so that they could no longer push up and get that breath, which meant they would, within a few minutes, suffocate to death. Pretty harsh. But when they get to Jesus to break his legs, one of the soldiers looks up and goes, dude, he's dead already. He's gone. The captain, according to God's word, the captain says, we need to be sure. So they take a spear and they stab Jesus in the side. The Romans were experts at killing people and knowing whether they were dead or not. And the thing that they were doing by stabbing him in the side was to see if his heart was still beating, if he had blood pressure. And based off of the way he bled or didn't bleed, showed them whether or not he was alive. And so when they stabbed him in the side, they knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that he was dead. And so this swoon theory that says that he just passed out is total hogwash. Doesn't make any sense. Not possible. So the next theory is the hallucination theory, and this one gives it away. It's pretty easy to understand. This theory states that somewhere between five and 700 people all had the exact same hallucination about the exact same guy at five different occurrences throughout Jesus' ministry after he rose from the dead. Guys, I don't care what drugs you're on, you're not going to have that many people have the same hallucination at five different locations. It's not how hallucinations work. So this one's not true either. The third one is the impersonation theory, and that one states that the disciples came in, stole the body, and put a doppelganger in Jesus' place, a stunt double. And this stunt double ran around for 40 days after the resurrection took place and then disappeared or ascended. The problem with this is, first off, too many people knew what Jesus looked like and knew what Jesus looked like very well, especially the Pharisees and the Sadducees whom Jesus had run into and condemned on many, many occasions. So for someone to step in and impersonate Jesus was not likely. Too many people knew Jesus too well to, for that to have gotten away with it. Secondly, the doppelganger, the stunt double, would have had to have pierced his hands, his side in a mortal wound, and his feet in order to act like Jesus. Let's face it, no one's going to do that. The next one is the spiritual resurrection theory. And this one states that exactly what the disciples thought when they first saw Jesus, that Jesus was a ghost. He was a spirit, that he didn't have a physical body. But let's be honest, Luke 24 smashes that theory to bits. Because Jesus looks out and goes, look at my hands and feet, see that I'm flesh and bone, give me something to eat. Because spirits don't do that. So, the last one, which is the most uh, spread theory that's out there is the theft theory. This is the theory that the Pharisees and Sadducees and Roman officials told the Jewish people had happened. They said the disciples snuck past the Roman guards somehow, rolled away a two-ton stone, stole Jesus' body, and snuck back through the Roman guard somehow, and that that's how Jesus rose from the dead. The problem with this is first that Roman soldiers never fell asleep on duty, and here's why. We know very clearly from historical records that if a Roman soldier left his post or fell asleep while on guard, he was immediately killed. There was no questions asked. There was no defend your side of what happened. There was, give me my sword, you're dead. Uh, See you later. We'll find somebody better than you to take your place. So no Roman soldier in their right mind especially not several Roman soldiers guarding a tomb, would have fallen asleep. And let's face it, even if they did, moving a two-ton stone away from the opening of a cave is not exactly a quiet venture. So they would have woken up. And so stealing the body was not possible. The Romans made sure of that. And so the theft theory holds no water either. 
But no matter which one of these theories you think might have some plausibility, here's the fact of history that squashes all the theories. The other 11 disciples, the 11 remaining, because Judas is out of the picture, the other remaining 11 disciples from what we know from the book of Acts and from history, historical records, we know that all 11 disciples were horribly tortured to deny Jesus. Ten of those 11 were tortured to the point that they died in the torture process. The only one who survived was John, and John survived being dipped in a vat of boiling oil multiple times and somehow survived it. And none of those 11 men ever denied Christ. Not only those 11, there were many other followers that were uh, killed. Stephen's a great example in the beginning of the book of Acts, who were killed in horrible, horrible ways, and they never denied Jesus. Guys, these aren't James Bond-type individuals. These aren't guys who were trained by the CIA to withstand torture. These were fishermen and tax collectors. And they held up in torture to the point of death Not because they were experts in resisting pain, but because what they believed was true. They didn't deny it, and they were not going to deny it because it was fact. That is one of the greatest proofs that Jesus lived and was who he said he was. So, that's all great, but the real question is, he real to you? Is he real to you? Is Jesus Christ real? Because you can know all these theories, but unless he is real, none of these theories matter. Doubt is okay. Doubt is an okay thing as long as you deal with that doubt properly. The fact is, is that when we doubt, we have an opportunity to ask some really good questions about what our doubts are. And when we go to the right people and ask the right questions, those doubts can be answered. If you know my story, you know that I spent many years of my college years um, basically studying evolutionary biology to disprove God. And I came out of that three and a half years of studying evolution with a stronger faith than I had going into it. Doubt can strengthen your faith if you go and get the questions you have answered. But the fact is, that means you've got to do some searching. And again, if you have doubts or questions, we have a staff here at Calvary that would love to sit down with you and answer all those questions. You know, I'm the science guy. Chad's the uh, faith biblical guy. Chet's the good old boy guy. We've got guys here that will answer your questions. We've been through so many things and we've studied so many things and we want to be here as a resource for you to have stronger faith. And so if you've got questions, please, please, please contact us. But is he real to you? Is he real to you today? Because if he is, you need to live like it. You need to live as if Christ is real in your life. Because there's a difference between believing and acting. Let me give you some examples. If you're a follower of Christ, you're supposed to be generous. Are you a generous person? Are you kind? Are you a peacemaker? Are you faithful to your spouse? And if you're single, are you living a life of purity? Are you a person who is actively seeking repentance and living out self-control against the temptations that you have in your life. Because that's what living a life for Christ looks like on the outside looking in. You see, I posed the question earlier, is he revealing himself to others through you? And that question's important because if you're a follower of Christ, your life should scream the name of Jesus. Your life, by the things you do and the things you say, should be a light in the world of darkness that others live in. You should be someone that people go to for hope because you have Jesus and they see it in your life. Because quite honestly, that's what Jesus' disciples did. You see, his reality, his reality led to their action. 
His reality led to their action. And his reality should lead us to act as well. And so, I've got a couple questions for you to close out. What action are you taking today and this next week because he's real in your life? And then, how are you revealing Jesus to others? Join me in prayer.